Proverbs 24. I'm going to read one verse this morning. Verse number 10. The Bible says, If thou faint the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now, in context, you read this chapter. Verse number 10 really stands on its own. Verses before this and verses after this don't really have anything to do with what verse number 10 is talking about. It's probably also, I didn't go and count, but it's probably also the shortest verse in this chapter. Doesn't mean that it's any less true. And it also doesn't mean that just because it's short doesn't mean there's not a lot to think on. So verse number 10, it says, If thou faint in the day of adversity. Now what is adversity? Shortly, adversity is hardship, struggle. You know, somebody working against you, you having to contend with that person. You know, every day we have to contend with the flesh. Why? Because the flesh wants the opposite of what the Spirit wants. Right? Contention certainly can fall under adversity. But adversity, big or small, is something that's in the way of you being able to do whatever you want to do. Okay, that could be something small, such as, you know, you want to get to work on time and alarm clock got unplugged from wall. That's a little bit of adversity. Right? Unless you're, you know, one of them weird people that can wake up without an alarm clock. You, I don't trust you people, and you guys scare me. Right? I need about 12 alarms. Okay? And I usually only hear one of them. So somebody is just like, oh, I know that it's whatever time right now, and I'm going to wake up. That's weird to me. Okay? But adversity can be something that's small. Adversity can be literally spiritual warfare. Right? Adversity can be any number of things. But adversity is called adversity because it's not easy. Something that is an adversary to you is something that you have to struggle to overcome. If it was something easy to overcome, it wouldn't be called adversity. Okay, adversity has the context of it requiring strength, effort. You've got a will to overcome it. It's not just something that's going to move itself out of the way. Okay? So it says, if... Thou faint in the day of diversity. Well, faint. What does that mean? You ran out of strength. Okay, the faint doesn't necessarily mean pass out. Faint means when it comes to battle, when it comes to contention. Think of a wrestling match. Okay? Guy can still be standing on his feet, or a boxer can still be on his feet, but if his arms are down and he can't move his legs no more, he's already fainted before he got knocked out. He's just clinging and hanging on. Okay. Faint certainly can mean that you got steamrolled, you didn't stand a chance. But faint can also mean you did all you could, but before the goal was accomplished, you ran out of energy. You ran out of ability. Okay, because the thing about adversity, adversity doesn't stop when you say, hey, can I have a break? Time out? No, there are no timeouts in adversity. Okay, I think of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite did not faint. When David commanded that all of the rest of the army pull back and leave Uriah out there by himself, the Bible says that he fought until his hand clave or cleaved to his own sword. That literally means that he squeezed onto the handle of that sword so hard that even when he couldn't purpose that he wanted to hold on to it. His arm had already cramped up to where he couldn't let go of the sword. Uriah knew that eventually he wasn't going to be able to hold on to the sword, so he made a way that his sword was going to be held on to whether he had the strength or not. Okay, that's someone whose strength did not fail them in the day of adversity. Uriah was slew, but Uriah didn't go out like a chump. Uriah didn't see the army pulling back, and he just decided, well, I'm just going to lay down and die. No, he fought to the end. Okay, the Bible says, quit you like men. What's happening? You give it everything. Right? You don't faint in the day of adversity. You keep fighting with all of your strength until either it's overcome or until it overcomes you. And you say, Brother Jordan, we've only got two sermons a day. 
we all thought this was going to be an easy and a happy church day where, you know, if they, we'll get there. Hang on. Okay. But in context, the Bible's talking about adversity. Adversity is not a pleasant thing. Adversity is not, because I wouldn't wish adversity on anybody, but I know that adversity is going to happen to all of us. Okay. Well, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now, let's, let's pick an example. We'll pick Brother Eddie. Brother Eddie, you like riding the motorcycles. Okay. Doesn't matter how strong somebody is at the gym. I don't care how much they squat. Don't care how much they bench press. Don't care how many sit-ups they can do. If their legs are so small that when the Harley stops and they go to put a leg out that the Harley falls on top of them, they're not strong. But you say, well, I'm stronger than so-and-so down at the gym. I don't care. You're weak. The bike is stronger than you are. Right? Back in the day, before I got fat and lazy, Brother Mike, used to work out all the time for football, I could squat upwards of 350 pounds. Okay. I cannot do that anymore because I hurt my back. And back no longer allows me to do things. Okay. Now, am I still the same person? Yes. Right? I still have the same legs. Okay. There's, believe it or not, underneath of all the protective covering that I have, there are still a few muscles left underneath of it all. Okay. In fact, every now and then, I, sometimes I get frustrated watching mom and dad sit there and try and work out, well, how are we going to move this around? And I just go over and push it. Job done. Right? Don't need no playing in. Don't need to break all the legs down off of it and turn it on its side. No, just move and I'll do it. Well, watch your back. I don't care. I'm tired of listening to it. Just let me do it. Uh, well, I'm, even if okay, I was just as strong as I was then, in order to squat with a, you know, a hurt back, you've got to wear like 80 pounds worth of protective equipment. Okay, you've got to make sure that you're only moving up and down and not sideways or forward and backwards and all that kind of stuff. Here's the thing about being strong in the day of diversity. In adversity, you don't get to take all of the safety nets with you. I don't care what you can lift at the gym. If you can't lift it on the job, it doesn't count. Now, you may have all of the safety, with all the safety gear on and with perfect form, you might be able to pick up 500 pounds. Okay, good for you. But if you can't pick up 500 pounds on Monday when you're not at the gym and that 500 pounds is in the way, you can't pick up 500 pounds. I don't care how strong you are on the easy days. Okay, well, you said going to the gym's not easy. Well, it is if your gym's in the middle of air conditioning and the floor is padded and you've got all of this, you know, things to make it convenient for you. Adversity is not convenient. Adversity doesn't give you the advantage. Adversity shows up when it's 80% humidity and 100 degrees outside and you've been laboring all day out in the sun and then drops 500 pounds on top of you and tells you to, you know, deal with it. If you can't lift it in the day of adversity, your strength is weak. I don't care how strong you think you are. The test of how strong you are is when you're tired, when it's not convenient, when nobody's looking, when nobody else is around. Right? It's just you and whatever it is that you have to strive against. If you can't deal with it and you faint, now, it doesn't say that you didn't try. It says you tried. But if your energy or your strength runs out before adversity is gone, you're too weak. Now, see, there's a lot of people okay, that throughout all of sporting event history, you, they weren't the fastest. They weren't the strongest. They weren't the smartest. They weren't the shiny pick where everybody's like, oh, that guy's going to be the great one. But they were just somebody that could stick their nose down to the grind and just work. And when things got hot, they just kept their shoulder to the wheel, and they just worked. And then when the day of adversity came, somebody else may have been stronger, but they gave up sooner. Somebody else may have been faster, but they ran out of steam. Somebody else may have been more intelligent, but their body gave out before their mind could do something spectacular. 
But that guy who everybody thought was just, oh, he's just nobody, think of Rudy. Right? Rudy got into one game in four years of college football. Okay, but when he got in, what did he do? All that hard work, it paid off. He stuck around because his strength, right, even though they tried to clobber him every practice and kill him, right, and the day of adversity, his strength didn't give out. Now, after adversity was over, he was black and blue and he was hurting and limping and everything else. But when it came time for adversity again, he was ready to go. And he always lasted to the end. But I don't care what you think you are. Okay, in context of these verses, adversity is your test. Did not Jesus say that the world would hate us because it hated him? Did he not say that, you know, Job said man's days are few and full of trouble. But then in addition to that, if the world hates us, the world will want to get rid of us. Your flesh hates the new creature. There's a whole lot of adversity going on out there. Now, here's the condition. They that live godly shall suffer persecution. You can have an easy life. You've just got to turn your back on God and do everything and live your life exactly the opposite of what God wants you to do. But if you do that, then, if you really are saved, you're going to be chastised. Okay, because if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. Chastisement's a whole lot harder than adversity. I can promise you that. So if you want to live the way that God wants you to live, there's going to be adversity. Not saying this is going to be every day, although it's probably going to be most days, in some shape or form. Right? Even if it's just contending with yourself, there's going to be adversity. The true test of how strong you are as a Christian is not what you can do in the safe space. Right? Now, I'll say this. People around here know how to worship. But just because you know how to worship inside of a church doesn't mean you know how to worship back at home. Doesn't mean that you know how to put on that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Not going to lie, this is the easiest place to worship in the world. I'll also say that it's the easiest place to preach that I know of. Why? Because people love preaching. People love coming to hear what thus saith the Lord. But on top of that, people around there come out to where it's easy to get in on something that other people want to do. Right? It's easy to feel at home when other people want to come out and do what it is that you want to do, which is what? Love God. To express how much they appreciate God. Just to revel in for a little while how good God's been to us. And then, because people around there do it with the right kind of spirit, God inhabits the praise of His people, just as He promised that He would. And then every now and then, it gets too big for, you know, us and then Brother Phil to take off running. Okay? But what he said, that's not adversity. The adversity is what happens before you get here and what after you get here. Now, don't get me wrong. Every now and then, there is adversity in the church house, but God usually sorts that out real quick. Okay? But when you wake up late or when you spent 25 minutes trying to fix that part in your hair that wasn't right and it was driving you nuts even though nobody else is ever going to even notice it but it's driving you nuts right because you've got it yeah brother Ray knows uh, on those days where you thought that what you picked out the night before matched and now it doesn't match and you've got to sit there and do well do I wear something wrinkly or do I wear something that's ironed but doesn't match right or on those days that you wake and you thought that you had food to eat and then you had to run to Kroger and then they's out of whatever you wanted to eat and he, what do you say that's little kinds of adversity right, there are days that your flesh will be the adversity even just trying to come and get to church I mean I empathize with Miss Rhonda she's got some back problems I had back problems it's not fun when going to bed you're in pain and when you wake up you're in pain Right? It's not fun when, you know, your back's hurting so bad that you've got to, like, contort yourself like uh, one of them people at the circus just to be able to tie your shoes. Okay? Because you can't just bend down and tie your shoes anymore. Right? That's adversity. But once you get here, those things tend to fade away. Right? But if you're adversity, right, if you're judging, well, I can do anything out there because of... Uh, what happened at church on Sunday? 
No, this is the easiest it's going to get. Right, this is as cruise control as things can be. You may know how to pray at this altar, but do you know how to pray at your altar? You may know how to sit down and receive preaching and instruction from the man of God, but do you know how to get it on your own? Right? Adversity is when you need a word from God and you're the only one you can rely on. Not because people don't love you, but because adversity, by definition, is shaped for each one of us. I'm going to face what I need to face. And, oh, by the way, adversity, if you're in the will of God, was designed by God to enter your life for a specific purpose. To resist adversity is to resist the will of God. But if you embrace adversity and understand, I need to be prepared not to faint in the day of adversity. Right, let's be honest. Right, we all know Joseph. About that big. About that big round. Okay. Joseph could come up and try to kick me in the knee all he wants to. I could pick Joseph up with one hand and throw him out that window. Okay. That's not adversity for Brother Jordan. Right? I would never do that to little Joseph. But one time he kept poking me on the shoulder and then dipping around to the other side of me. And so I got it. And so I picked him up and shook him for a second. But he thought that was funny. Ever since then, now when I shake his hand, he makes me shake his entire body. Right? That's not adversity. What's that? That's just a speed bump. Right? That's not going to derail me. I've just got to stop and deal with it for a second, get over it, and then go. Okay, adversity is when Goliath walks around the corner and God says, get to the other side. Right, adversity is when you're yoked up together with the Lord and you're plowing and all of a sudden there hits a knot in a log or there's a root that the plow gets stuck on and God says, we just got to keep pushing. And you don't know how long you're going to have to push. You don't know when the root's going to break. All you know is, is that you got to put everything you got into it until that root breaks. Well, you say, well, how long? As long as it takes. Adversity is eventually overcome. But you know how you overcome adversity? You have to endure it. Did not Peter say, that resist the devil and he will flee from you? You cannot overcome the devil, but you can endure it. Right? How do we overcome? Through Christ. How did Christ refute the devil? With the word of God. The devil just kept tempting. What did he do? He just kept quoting scripture. And then what eventually happened? He went away. You're not stronger than the devil, but you may be strong enough to endure until it's over. But if your strength to give out, then adversity overcame you. You don't have to be the strongest person in the world. You've just got to be strong enough to last. Right, Naj? When Naj got here, he was about as big around as Joseph was. Right now, Naj looks very impressive, and his shirts are very tight now. Okay, I'm kidding, Naj. I love Naj. Right, but Naj certainly can do things at the gym now that he couldn't do when he got here. Right, but if Naj goes to work and he's got to move something... It doesn't matter who's look, how many people are there to help. If they said, Naj, move it, and Naj couldn't move it, Naj's not strong enough. Now, see, there are certain things. Right? You can't overcome the flesh with fleshly things. Right? You've got to use the right tools. Thankfully, we are equipped. I mean, I see guys all day long. If Naj was smart enough to figure out how to drive a forklift, Naj can pick up almost anything. But, well, what are you saying, brother? Sometimes... God gives you what you need, you're just not using it. You may not have to be strong enough to move a mountain. But if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, be removed into the sea, and Jesus said it'd be done. Your faith is a great tool. Faith, literally, will give you the hope that you need to endure. Pain hurts, I get it, pain bad. Pain is a sign that what is happening is not good for you. That's what pain is. It's your foot or your arm or your elbow telling your brain, hey, something bad's happening. That's what pain is. But see, pain for a little while can be endured. Pain is not stronger than you are. 
we don't like pain. Trust me, sign me up for the no pain category, right? Put me in that neck of the woods. But see, pain for a little while, it's not going to kill you. There's a pain that will cripple you, but there's also a pain that you can endure. Our first reaction is, pain, run away. But I mean, literally, if we're talking about physical pain, who endured more pain than Christ on the cross? If we're talking about emotional pain, who endured more than God the Father and God the Son when they had to break fellowship? When all the sin of eternity, past, present, and future, was laid on the Son of God and they had to break fellowship for the first time and the only time in all of recorded existence. That was painful. In fact, he cried on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, meaning, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? But because of that, we have the promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. You may be the only one in your view, but your faith can draw that one that sticks closer than a brother. I mean, Brother Greg, one of my favorite quotes, half of his Bible is just quotes pinned down that he's heard people say. One of my favorite ones, when you can't trace God's hand, you can trust his heart. You may not be able to see him, but you know that he's there. Your faith is what gives you the hope to endure that pain for a season. Because we know things don't come to stay. What do they do? They come to pass. Adversity is overcome so that you're stronger for it. It's on the Sydney things. It right? doesn't matter what comes in my life. I am stronger for the things that God has brought me through. In truth, my strength is not good enough. I'm a flesh will fail you. If you trust in what you can do, it's never going to be enough. I don't care how much faith you have, you don't have enough faith that without what God did for us, you could have made it to heaven. I don't care how strong you are, don't care how spiritual you are, we are still cursed by sin. We're still in this limited state where we can't be what we will be one day. We strive to become more like what we ought to be, but we understand that that strive that adversity, it's never going away as long as we're on this face of this earth. Just because I overcame yesterday does not mean I'm overcoming today. I've got to be able to endure adversity today. Like, to be more like what I'm supposed to be. The easiest day is the day that you overcome adversity. Right? The valley's tough. And climbing up the side of a mountain is tough. But the easiest day is when you get to sit on the top of the mountain and the Lord turns you around and says, see where you were and where you are now? The hardest day is when you give in to adversity and you're stuck because adversity doesn't give up. Just because you wave a white flag doesn't mean that adversity turns around and leaves. The hardest place to be is between a rock and a hard place. Where's that? Where adversity is trying to grind you into the ground. The only way to make adversity worth it is to overcome. But if it's not my strength, then what strength do we rely upon? Well, the strength, first off, okay, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. Does not the Bible say, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? Does not the Bible say that even though the arm of flesh will fail you, you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you? You say, well, Brother Jordan, you're sounding like as hard as we try, we're never going to be able to overcome on our own. Exactly. That's the whole point. If God knew you could do it on your own, He wouldn't give you the Holy Ghost to seal you until the day of redemption. And He wouldn't have promised to do all the things for you after you got saved to make sure that you live the life that you ought to. You can't read this book the way that it was written and come to any other conclusion that after you get saved, you still need a whole lot of help. We are a needy people. But see, the Apostle Paul said that when I am weak, then am I strong. 
Why? Because God's grace is made perfect in weakness. In order to become strong, you must admit that you are weak. The strength where we overcome is not ours. It is the strength given to us by God. I don't have a strength for you that when you're heartbroken and you're destitute and you're on the verge of depression, I don't have a strength that I can lend you that says, here's the strength you need to go to church and worship. I don't have that in a vault somewhere. There's no mason jar that I can crack open and say, here, here you go. But you know who has strength like that? God. Now, does he give it to you in, you know, lump sum? But here, here's all the strength that you're going to need for the rest of your life. No, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. You've got to believe that God will give you the strength to get through today that you need for today. Or that God will equip you yesterday for what you're going to need to overcome today. That if you need to be equipped for something tomorrow, that God will be faithful to supply you with what he promised he would supply you. But I do not go to the gas station once and then never go back. I have to keep going back. Right? Because my car uses this thing called gas. And if I don't put more in, car don't go. So why do so many of us try to treat church, try to treat spirituality, oh, well, that was a great revival. I'll be good for a while. You weren't good for a while before the revival. Why would you be good for a while after the revival? What do you need? You need more strength. Where do you get it from? The gas station. What's that called? Well, there's a whole lot of places that you can find strength, but it all leads back to one person, Christ. Where do we get the strength to go day to day? From Christ. When the flesh isn't willing, where do you get the strength that spiritually your spirit is indeed willing? Willing enough to overcome the unwilling of the flesh. You don't get it from me. You don't get it from Brother Doug. You don't get it from fellowship with the saints. Where do you, you get it from God? Where do you have that strength that is able to look at a Goliath and in the gable end of your soul say, I know that God's going to kill him with the stone that's in the sling. But before you throw it, before... God ever kills him, you, I, God's going to kill him. How do you know that? Because God said he would. I, I was thinking the other day, but Ron, everybody liked to throw off on Elijah underneath the juniper tree. But see, Elijah had just done three, three and a half years of adversity. Hadn't rained that long. Why did it stop raining? Because God told Elijah to prophesy against the rain that it wouldn't rain as a sign to the people that worshiping Baal and all their idols of the grove and the false idols and all that 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 wasn't what God approved of well for three and a half years they still too hard headed to get the message uh, well fast forward three and a half years give or take and then there's a great showdown one day on some mountain somewhere okay, the prophets of Baal they're trying to pray down fire from heaven See, we look at that story in hindsight. You do realize that when Elijah prayed, fire had never come down from heaven before. He was asking God to do something he had never seen, he had never even heard about. Now, is God able to do it? Absolutely. Because long before God ever sent fire down out of heaven for Elijah to consume that burnt sacrifice on the altar, right? he poured out fire and brimstone on Sodom. Right? Now granted, nobody asked God to destroy Sodom. He poured out judgment on them. But if God can send fire and brimstone, surely he can just send fire. Right? But Elijah said, Lord, go and read what he prayed. He said, Lord, I've done everything that you told me to do. Down to the T. I followed all your instructions. So Lord, I pray that you'd send down fire out of heaven because that's what you told me to pray because God's the one that came up with the challenge. And he said, and I pray that you do it to show these people who the one true God is. And then fire came down out of heaven. But you do realize that Elijah just stood in front of who knows how many thousands of people. I know how many prophets of the grove and Baal that he slew that day. But how many thousands of people knowing 
that if he does one thing wrong on a hot day, he got there middle of the day. And he stayed until almost the sun went down watching them suckers make a fool of themselves. In the middle of a drought where there is no water, he's asking them to go round up all the water they can find to pour it on top of the altar, pour it on top of the sacrifice, and then down into that trench that he dug. So I'm sure by sitting there in the middle of the sun for most of the day, his body's tired. But he's got to get up and he's got to make up an altar that meets God's special. Go read the Old Testament. God has a speck on what the altar should be. And if it isn't, God's not going to accept the offering on top of it. Then he's got to arrange the wood. Then he's got to kill the animal and then lay the sacrifice out like he would before he would start the fire on a normal burnt sacrifice. All the while, he's got to keep people that are defiled from defiling the sacrifice. Then, after all that, he's got to find a way to pour water on top of it without the unclean vessels that had the water in it touching the clean sacrifice. What do you say? There was a lot of adversity on that day. It wasn't as easy as Elijah showing up and saying, Lord, send down fire from heaven. And then fire from heaven came down. Though he had to endure a whole lot. That probably made him angry in the flesh. Why? Because I go back and read it, and just reading it makes me angry at what some of the stuff they was doing. I can't imagine being there. But yet, what did he do? His strength met the adversity. Until when? Until God showed up and delivered him from it. So can you imagine being on that mountaintop? He's just heard all the people of Israel bow down and proclaim that God is God. They're going to destroy all the idols and all the totem poles and everything else that they had. And then after he, he said, wow, that was amazing. Then he goes off onto a cliff. He prays that it rain again. Then his servant says, hey, I see a cloud about the shape of a man's hand. And Elijah said, hey, hurry up and get back to the town. It's getting ready to rain. And then he outran the king's chariots all the way back to town, outrunning the flood that was coming from the gully washer. And after all of that, the queen still says, let's go kill Elijah. But he's just on the highest mountaintop of the mountaintops. And then he finds adversity's not gone. But I don't fault him for sitting underneath the juniper tree. Because I've had many a days where I'm like, Lord, if that doesn't stop the adversity, what's going to stop the adversity? Right? If you showing up and doing that doesn't make adversity go away, what in the world's going to make it? You know what the answer is? Nothing. Adversity is a part of our lives. Can't get away from it. Daily, Christ suffered adversity. So daily, we, being Christ-like, shall suffer adversity. Some adversity is not as bad as the others. You can get up and call me every name under the sun. I don't care. I've probably heard it all before and probably been called worse. It's not going to phase me. Right? But you get up and start saying things about somebody that I care about, then we're probably going to have issues. Right? You can... Yeah, I've been with that. But you guys know the difference between big adversity and little adversity. There's some adversity that it's a bug on the windscreen. But you had to drive through the bug and you're going to have to stop and clean the window off. Some adversity is inconvenient. Other adversity flattens all four of your tires, blows out one of the axles, and you're stuck pushing the car trying to get to the next gas station to just get a tow truck to come and help you out. But that's a lot of adversity. But adversity is still adversity. You know how you judge adversity? Either you're strong enough to overcome it, you're strong enough to endure it, or your strength was weak. You were overcome. Now, I've told you, you can try to do it on your own. Not going to be strong enough. You're not going to be able to overcome of yourself. You may be able to come things, overcome certain things of the flesh on your own, but your heart deceitfully is wicked. No man can know it. Your tongue has been set on fire of hell. Set on fire of hell. Right? You don't know what you're capable of on your worst day, and yet you're going to trust the strength of the flesh? 
Now you can rule and reign over the flesh. You can control it. You can make it do what you want to do. But your strength better be rooted in something other than your sin-cursed flesh. Your strength ought to be rooted deep down spiritually where inwardly you've got that altar that is God's and that's where you expect your strength to come from. Your strength's coming from out of this world delivered to you by a thrice holy God for the specific purpose of getting you through whatever God's allowed to come into your life. You know why adversity is so important for a Christian? One, you grow during adversity. If you're resisting something, you're becoming stronger for it. You may not be working out your leg muscles or your arm muscles. You may be working out that faith muscle. You may be working out that praise muscle. You may be working out that praying muscle. But whatever it is that you're resisting, that will become stronger. It will improve you. God doesn't just allow hardness to come into your life for no reason. That He's not a cruel and unjust taskmaster. He loves you. So those things that resist you are meant to make you more into the image of His Son. But two, adversity is something that happens outwardly. That by definition, if you're resisting something, people are going to be able to see it. Otherwise, you're not resisting it. Resisting means you've got everything in your life geared around not letting that thing overcome you. Okay? Well, by that, if you're resisting outwardly, who sees it? Everybody. If adversity comes into your life, people are going to see you standing against it. Now, again, I've said sometimes adversity, very easy. Okay, thank the Lord for them days. Why? Because at one point, those things weren't so easy in your life. Truly think about the things that used to derail you, and then now look at how the Lord's giving you enough strength that He's matured you as a Christian. Now, it don't even, you don't even bat an eye at it anymore. Things you used to struggle with, now the Lord's put them underneath your feet. But, you still need to strive. Why? Because striving is the testimony of a Christian. Adversity comes so that outwardly you can say, I may not be stronger than this thing, but God's made me strong enough, or will make me strong enough, that I can resist long enough until He takes it away. You know what the Apostle Paul understood about that thorn in the flesh that he prayed for the Lord to remove three times? He understood he wasn't stronger than the thorn. He couldn't make the thorn go away. He understood that the thorn, if there, is going to have to be addressed. He couldn't ignore the thorn. But he also understood, by the end of it, that when God said, my strength is made perfect and weak, he understood that the thorn could be endured. Couldn't be overcome, couldn't be removed, but it could be endured. Now, enduring is not as fun as overcoming. And a lot of times, it lasts longer than overcoming because you have to endure for longer. But if you know that it will come to pass. The Apostle Paul knew that the thorn in the flesh one day is going to be gone. And he knew on the day that it was gone, he's going to have a body like Christ. So he was fine with the thorn being there. He understood that God would give him the strength day by day to be able to endure that thorn. But you want to know what the Apostle Paul said about his life? He said, I have fought a good fight. And he said, I have finished my course. He didn't say that he set the world record for the course. It didn't say that he ran it in increments and then eventually tallied up enough to where it was as if he had run a race. No, he said he finished. It didn't say that he finished sprinting. I mean, he also let us run with patience the race, that is rep the race that is set before us. He said, I may have crawled across that finish line, but I finished. He's saying, I endured the race. Not every day was overcoming and squashing things underneath of my feet, shouting and praising and hooping and hollering. 
But he says, every day God gave me the strength to get where I needed to be so that at the end, I crossed the finish line. Enduring's not fun, but enduring is worth it in the end. Enduring doesn't mean that you're going to be you know, crossing the finish line to ticker tape parade and they're going to hoist you up and say hip hip hooray. Enduring most of the time is long after the press and everybody else has left. You're still there trying to cross the finish line but you cross the finish line. Nobody's going to be paying attention to well who's the last person to finish. It doesn't matter. You finished. Endurance is about finishing. I've seen a whole lot of people that took off with a full head of steam and where they at now, they didn't finish. They're not even in a race no more. I've seen a whole lot of people think that they were stronger than something only to find out that it buried them. I've seen a whole lot of people think, well, that's not anything to worry about today until today became tomorrow and they weren't ready to deal with it. Then I've also seen a whole lot of people that things that seem so insurmountable in other people's lives don't get me wrong you get a flat tire it's a bad day especially if you got one of them goofy ones in the trunk that's not a real tire no more and then you have to go get the real tire put onto the old rim and then you got to deal with all that that's a bad day but I've seen some people get flat tires on things that ruined other people's lives you saying was what they had any different no, they was just prepared to endure it. Some people got the flat tire and then decided to push the car off the side of the mountain because they well, what's the point anymore? Well, that seems a little dumb. Right, if I get a hangnail, y'all don't take me out back behind the barn and shoot me because I'm worthless and, you know, just tire. Whole point that adversity can be overcome certainly can be endured or it'll overcome you those are the only three outcomes either in advance God's made you strong enough to overcome it God's given you enough strength to last through it or you give up at some point either your strength gives out or you give up but why do you need to endure what do you need to overcome? You need strength. Now again, we could take any of these kids, Brother Brian, around here. They think they're strong and then put them in an arm wrestling contest with both Peter. Right? Then they realize their strength is pretty weak. Right? We aren't judging strength off of what this sees, what this hears, what this can understand. No, we need to judge strength off of what the Lord judges strength at which is how much of him is in you how much of his word have you hid in your heart that you might not sin against him how much time have you layered in the, labored in the prayer closet not just praying for, praying for others in your life right that you've spent enough time alone with him in his word and in prayer that that strength that he wants you to use has been developed in you Uh, that's how he judges strength that woman with the two mites you know why she was stronger than anybody else had? the adversity was that's all she had doesn't matter that it was a little she gave everything she had and in God's eyes she gave more than anybody else there that day you know what that tells me God took care of that widow woman's needs that day why because he promised that he'd take care of the needs of his people he said, well, it's just two mites. It doesn't matter to her. That was all her strength. And she gave all of it unto the Lord. If you give everything you've got, even though it may not be enough, God will make up the difference. Well, you say, it's hard giving everything you've got every day. I understand that. But is not God worth it? He only saved your soul from dying and going to hell. He only loaded you daily with benefits. So many that if you tried to sit down and count your blessings, right, even if you did name all the ones that you knew of when we get to heaven, you're going to find out your list was a whole lot shorter than his on what he gave to you day in and day out. When you feel like 
you just about down to the end of your rope. Because we've all been there. We all think, well, I can't do this no more. Until you start thinking about somebody that's dependent upon you to overcome. Or you start thinking about all the other times that God has delivered you from whatever it was that you was enduring. Or you start thinking about how if you give up, other people are going to have to pay the price. And what happens? There's something way down in here that gets a little bit of spark. Like Popeye just ate some spinach. Right? Next thing you know, you got enough strength to endure just a little bit longer. Just a little bit longer. He didn't say you'd have to endure for forever. He did promise that he'd give you a space of grace. He did promise that he'd give you... Did he not tell his disciples to get away to a desert place for a while and rest? Right? There are days of rest. There are days where the Lord's going to say, well done. But in order to get to them days, what do you got to do? You got to endure today. Enduring and struggling is only worth it if you finish. I don't care how much money people sink into a business adventure. You know what's impressive? The guy who actually succeeds. Right? The one who finishes the idea. Gets everything running. All the gears are moving. All the people are in the right positions. Why? Because then they start making money. It's worth it in the end because they finished. You could throw billions of dollars or whatever project you want to. If it never happens, it wasn't worth it. You can endure for 99 days, but if God wanted you to endure just one more and you give up, you got nothing for all the effort. Enduring, the joy of enduring, is that on the other side, you get to see where you started and what God's turned you into. The joy of overcoming is that you can look at other people and say, used to, that gave me, that used to really bother me, but the Lord delivered me from it. He made me strong enough to where now I can handle that. Not because of what I am, but because of how good He is. You can look at something in your life and say, I remember when, well, whatever you're facing today could be tomorrow's molehill instead of a mountain. It's all dependent upon one thing, whether or not you want to. You want to know why I don't go to the gym no more, Brother Mike? Because I don't want to. I got smart real quick. There's no sense in doing any of that no more. Okay? Maybe taking it out of context, but I even had Bible to back me up. Bodily exercise profit is little. There's a little bit of profit in it, but it ain't much. Right, but you want to know why people don't endure? Because their want to gives out. He'll give you the strength if you're relying upon Him for the strength. You're not relying upon you to figure out how to do it. But if you're waiting on God in the middle of your adversity, God will deliver just when you need it. May not be the most convenient time. May not be the most expected time. But it'll be right on time. And on the other side, enduring will be worth it. But just because you lasted a little while doesn't mean that you lasted what you should have. Because until you overcome it, you're going to have to endure it again and again and again. So don't break, base your strength off of you or another person. You're supposed to base your strength off of your adversity. Off of how much you can do for the Lord. And if you start basing how strong we are based off of what is out there in the world, I come to one conclusion, we're very weak. But I know a God who is able to give unto us strength that the world knows nothing about. Strength that will always overcome, always endure, will always stand the test of time. Because it's not strength made by man, conjured by man, come up with by man. No, it is strength that comes from a holy God down to the child that he loves so that they can be what he instructed them to be, the image of his son. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.